am not okay. There are times, sometimes, it's, it's twice a day, especially on Mondays, but there are times where I'm not, and there are times where I am okay. And what I've learned is that it is okay to not be okay. Here's the other part of it. But you shouldn't have to live that way. Okay? So, what I learned from 9-11, I was stationed at Andrews Air Force Base, and that day started for me as a phone call. And it was one of our operations people who called in and said, oh my God, have you seen on the, on the TV? Turn on the TV, do this, do that. I'm in the military hangar <laughs> at a base. We don't have a TV up there, right? So we're trying to look on USA or uh, abcnews.com and cnn.com, all these other places. And we can't get online because everything's jammed up. We're trying to make phone calls to find out from the ops officers on base, what's going on, right? Public affairs, what's going on? And all the phone lines are jammed. We can't get out. We can't talk to anybody. Then we got a message that the base is shut down and we can't do anything. And at the time I had injured my leg. I have five pins in my left leg. So I, uh, I was on crutches, went downstairs and where our TV was located. And I'm sitting there in this room crammed in together with 15 other guys. Yeah, they're smelly by that time, right? Even though it was that early in the morning, but we're all sitting there watching TV, trying to figure out what's going on. And I remember going, you know what? I just need to take a look. I remember standing at the edge of the hangar with the doors open and looking out in that direction where the water tower was, because that was the direction that DC was. And it was a clear, blue, beautiful day. And all I saw was a thin tendril uh, of smoke just rising on the, on the horizon. And I snapped out of it. I went, whoa, I got a job to do. I got to get back upstairs to operations and see what's going on and see what we can do. The next 27 hours was kind of just a blur. We were trying to figure out how to get a hold of all our pilots. We had some that were reservists that were flying with the airlines. We had some of our crewmen who were reservists flying with them. We actually had some maintainers that were reservists that were working with the airlines as maintenance people. So we were trying to figure out how do we get a hold of people? How do we get a, you know this? How did we do that? I remember stopping at one point in the middle of the day and we all got together and trying to think about how do we figure out how to get a hold of these people when we can't call out and we can't get on the internet. <laughs> so uh, I remember we all got together and we started talking about it. And have you ever heard that saying? Um, if those, you know, if those around you are losing their head and you're able to keep yours, you don't know what's going on, <laughs> right? You have, you have no clue what's going on. That's, that was us. And what we figured out to do was anytime someone called in, hey, you know, you're, you're eating up a line, but stay online. Can you call this number? And we were using them to call the numbers for us and to also um, do call waiting with us, conference calling. And that's how we were able to get a hold of everyone and get a hold of this. We had aircraft in the air, all different parts of the world. We had one in Japan. We had one, you know, in New York. They were they were supposed to be coming back to, to DC and they ended up going to New York. We had another one, you know, in Europe and all kinds of places like that. So trying to make reservations for them to be able to stay somewhere and trying to find places that they can eat and, you know, all these different things. And 27 hours later, I finally made it home, took a shower, you know, did all that, slept for like maybe six hours and then I'm going right back in. And it wasn't that that really stuck with me as much. What stuck with me the most was three days later. Three days later, I lived on the other side of the Pentagon. I lived, uh, I was talking with somebody about it earlier. I lived Columbia Pike near, near uh, Bob and Edith Steiner. And uh, anybody from Northern Virginia knows that place, right? And it is right down the street from the Pentagon, right down the street. To drive home, I had to drive 14th Street Bridge right there, right beside it, seeing the smoke as I was going home. So for whatever reason, I went into DC and as I'm driving around, it's dark, it's like this. It's not quite full dark, but it, it, there's a lot of shadow going on. And I remember while I'm driving, I stopped at a stoplight and I looked over 
something caught my eye, some shadow moved or something like that. And I remember I looked over and there was a Humvee with armed U.S. soldiers at almost every street corner. They had positioned it so that the light wasn't shining on them specifically and they were in shadows, but they were there. They were armed and it was sad. That's when I broke down. That's when it hit me. That's when I knew they won. If we're gonna live like this, they won. That was the first time it ever hit me that I knew when I was not okay. So in talking to my friends and talking to everybody else, I talked about it the next day at the command, we were talking about different things and it helped. It helped to talk about it. It helped to get it out. It helped to, to leak, get rid of that poison that was around my heart. And so as we kept talking about things and as we kept going, I learned that sometimes that's what you need. Sometimes you need just someone to talk to about it. And from there, it's moved me along a path. I became an entrepreneur. I kept trying to, uh, you know, start my own business. I wanted to make a lot of money, you know, all these different things. And I kept getting pushed back toward doing volunteer work, first with the Red Cross, then with Team Rubicon, then with the Mission Continues, and it was more veteran themed. And then I found the Military Veteran Peer Network. And I found myself rearranging my schedule for my business so that I could have volunteer time to do my work. And they turned around and said, hey, we're offering you a part-time position. And guess what? I took it. And at some point they kept reeling me in, kept reeling me in. And next thing you know, here I am. There's only 38 of us in Texas. We're a, we're a branch of the Texas Veterans Commission. And our job is to provide peer services for SMVF, service members, veterans, and families. And guess who defines the families? The veteran. So a girlfriend that I dated six years ago, because Lord knows that she needs help after that, right? <laughs> so if she says that she needs help and says that, that she needs different things, then she can get the help. And thankfully, it's programs like this, programs like this table right here. You know, you guys are awesome. Mental Health America. It's programs like Stop One and all of us getting together and talking about this and sharing our resources that is gonna, that helps me every day realize they didn't win. They did not win and we're the ones that are gaining from that. And I guess, you know, in the immortal words of Forrest Gump, that's all I got to say about that. <laughs>